the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, Soviet AA tanks unborn, squad mates conquering new grounds, and metal beasts, the first R-73 carrier in War Thunder. The summer extreme event is now over, so today we are going to see its main air award. This is the Su-25BM, a special modification of a famous strike aircraft. It has undergone an upgrade process, receiving modern navigation and aiming systems, a head-on display, and a wider choice of available armament. This machine is propelled by a twin turbojet engine. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the center of the fuselage and between the wing spars. Steel and titanium alloy armor plates improve survivability, and bulletproof glass protects the cockpit. Its forward-firing armament includes a twin 30mm autocannon with 250 rounds of ammo. This aircraft can also carry gun pods, conventional, retarded, and guided bombs, as well as a rich choice of rockets and guided missiles, including the long-awaited R-73. These new air-to-air -air missiles are the main new in-game feature of the Su-25BM. Unlike the R-60, the R-73 doesn't go onto the external pylons. This design feature has both pros and cons. On the one hand, you can now take up to four AAMs. Will it turn this strike aircraft into a true sky fighter? No, not really. It's still inferior to top fighters in terms of speed, and even the most advanced close-range missiles won't compensate for this. Still, the new Frogfoot can certainly boast better defensive capabilities. Thanks to thrust nozzles, the R-73 can easily reach its target from almost any position. The only way your opponent can save themselves is by using flares in time. On the other hand, the new AAMs occupy hard points you could have used for more air-to-surface ordnance. Is this sacrifice worth it? Well, we believe you could limit yourself to just two R-60 missiles when running a set of unguided weaponry, like S-25 O rockets. Now, when you only use guided air-to-surface weaponry, hardpoints number two and nine used to remain empty. The Su-25BM can fill them with the new missiles. In guided CAS, the new Frogfoot is something in between the early version and the T modification. The BM can carry TV-guided ordnance, but it lacks handy guidance systems. The new SU is a solid vehicle capable of completing combat tasks and defeating the enemy. Should you sell the coupon or keep this beast for your collection? It's up to you. The Luftwaffe had been a major pain for all European armies since day one of the war. The Soviet Union felt it too. German aviation revealed numerous issues, including a major scarcity of small-caliber anti-aircraft artillery. Soviet planes attacking German convoys often suffered heavy losses, but Junkers and Heinkel aircraft could attack and leave unpunished, since there was basically nothing to use against them. The nation simply had no widespread anti-aircraft guns. Moreover, the few options they did have had no platform to mount them on. In the early days of the war, trucks and even tractors were scarce. What the USSR tried to do was to install AA guns and MGs onto light tanks, which could also enable the future vehicle's off-road capability. Boris Spitalny, an ambitious gun designer, decided to use this trend to his advantage. He'd already retrofitted his aircraft Schwuck for the T-60 before. So in March 1942, he put his efforts into adding the unsuccessful Shah 37 aircraft cannon to the new T-70 tank. Spitalny's design bureau even created a special AA turret for the tank. By the end of September, the fresh ZUT-37 started trials. Its name meant Zenitnaya Ustanovka Tankovaya, which is Russian for anti-aircraft tank system. But it didn't look much like an SPAAG. It had a miserable ammo pool of only 50 rounds, an inconvenient reload mechanic, 
a terrible turret turn speed, and low accuracy. Moreover, shooting the gun threw the sight off. The tank didn't even reach the fire on the go test stage. Still, the army needed AA defenses so badly that the designers were given a second chance, with a long list of required improvements. Three months later, a new prototype ZUT-37 was introduced. It was almost entirely remade. It lost a ton of mass, the turret got wider, the ammo pool was increased to 200 rounds, and spread into clips of five. Guidance angles were improved, and external mechanisms were armored. Moreover, a scope was added according to the requirements. Still, some flaws remained. The turret was still slow, and the real fire rate was just half of the required 60 shots per minute. Nevertheless, the commission thought it was good enough to start building a test batch. It looked promising. Only when the tank was greenlit, the SHA-37 cannon had already been discontinued for six months. Spitalny continued to fight. He assured the army that he had a third prototype that would fulfill all the demands. He even proposed to have some tests. He asked the army's permission to build a test batch using the T-80 chassis and his new SHA-45 cannon. But the fate of the ZUT-37 was sealed. It was already close to the Battle of Kursk, a battle that put a stop on the production of light tanks. The last T-70s left their factories in November of 1943. Spitalny's new cannon had no chassis it could use anymore. The path of Soviet light tanks ended, and multiple other AA tanks never left the blueprint stage. The American M15 and M17 filled the mobile AA defense niche for a while. The Soviets would soon make a new original self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, later known as the ZSU-37. Urban sprawl and sunlit beaches, snowy plains and tropical forests, our squad mates have visited so many places already, but still there is some terra incognita left. Following your requests, today we're going to fight at the abandoned factory. We wouldn't call this place symmetrical, but the main attack lines and key positions are similar for both teams. For our case study, we'll pick the left side. Scenario 1 implies moving toward the center of the map through the flank. Your first target is the buildings found on the northern height. This place is good for controlling the upper part of the map and two strategic points. Once you spawn, head for square A4. As soon as you're close, split up. One of you should stay on the foot of the hill while the other one should drive up to the hangar's wall. Get ready to meet enemy forces driving around the hill via the northern side. Distract your opponents in turns, giving your squad mate a chance to deliver a precise shot. Once the first wave of attackers is finished, it's time to get to point A. Your best bet is to reach it from two sides at once so that you can vice the enemy. Be extra quick and cooperative at this stage if you don't want to be left alone against the enemy. Having taken the point, you should move to the enemy side, take positions next to the outermost hangars, and get ready for the next wave. The enemy will attack via a flat field, so defense shouldn't be complicated. Your further activity will depend on the battle situation. If your allies manage to cap another strategic area and the enemy points are vanishing quickly, all that's left is just some weight. If your team is struggling, you'll have to take point B yourself. One of the squad mates should head to the center, while the other one should move to a hangar in the southeast part of the height to provide cover. In scenario two, both squad mates should also spawn on the northern point, but this time they should head to the center of the map. Player 1 needs to rush directly to point B. Player 2 should move in parallel, one square to the north, until they reach the water tanks in square C4. They should also keep an eye north. Some enemies might attack from the hangars on the height. After clearing the central part of the map with crossfire, the squad mates should capture point B. And then, without waiting for the second wave to arrive, they should move to the enemy side of the map. One player should take a good position next to the buildings in square D5. This place gives them control over some of the path to the central point and a good view onto the northern height. The other one should drive to the southeastern hangar at said height. This layout will allow both of you to control the central and northern parts of the map as well as cover each other with fire. 
That's all the tactics for today. Remember that a squad's success depends on fast decision-making and coordination. Feel free to change your tactics according to the battle situation and always remember to share information with your allies. What location would you like to see next? Tell us in the comments. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Star Wars Niels. What's the most powerful anti-tank missile? Hi, Niels. We'd say the most powerful ATGMs are the AGM-114K Hellfire II and the 9M-123 Chrysanthema. Their armor penetration rate is 1,200 millimeters. Tree, though, asks, which is the strongest, as in most thrust, jet engine in the game? Hi there, Tree, though. Right now, it's found on the Yak-141. It can output up to 14,900 horsepower in afterburner mode. Another question comes from Tizanic and 1900 others. Which are the best tactics for planes like the Italian Tornado IDS? Hello, Tizanic. Same as on other tornadoes, you should avoid turn fights and focus on your main task using conventional and guided bombs. Mario CXD writes, are there any Spanish vehicles in the game? And in what tech tree is each one found? Hi, Mario. There's only one Spanish vehicle for now, the Premium Centauro, found in the Italian tech tree. By the way, even the crew speaks Spanish. And the last comment for today was written by One Star Flash. Which one is better, M1A1 AIM or M1A1 HC? Hi there. The differences between these machines are minimal. The AIM version has better thermals, while the HC one has more smokes, a dozer blade, and a soft kill APS. In practice, both of them share similar efficiency levels and could play along well in a single set. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to never trust non-credible defense. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.